Good afternoon. I'm Stefan Fenter, Portfolio Manager at Sunland Private Wealth. And I'd like to welcome you to our fiduciary and tax specialist session. Uh, as high net, net worth investors have unique goals and challenges and ambitions, they often require a customized end-to-end -end solution that goes above and beyond conventional investment management. This could vary from investment portfolio construction to intergenerational wealth planning and cross-geographical -geographic tax structuring. I want to introduce our two specialist speakers today, Stanley Brown, the Head of Fiduciary and Tax for Sunland Private Wealth. He holds an income tax, MTP SA, AG SA, and Anton Maskevich, who is the Fiduciary and Tax Specialist. He holds a CFP, a BCOM LLB, and an HDIP in international tax. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity and good often to everyone. Um, as Stephen has mentioned, I am the head of the fiduciary and tax department. We are a team of eight people. We sit up in Johannesburg in Sandton. Um, in the team, we've got four specialists specializing in giving advice, and then we've got the support staff that basically support us, as well as um, the deceased estate admin administrators. So, so I'm heading up the department, and basically we've got myself, um, Anton, Christine, and Clay. Um, that's doing the advice for the clients, and then we've got the support team basically taking care of the finances, the administration to the deceased estate, etc. Um, as part of what we do at the fiduciary, as fiduciary tax services that we provide for our high net worth and ultra high net worth clients, is we look at trusteeship, as Stephen has made mention of. So, in terms of trusteeship, we act as the independent corporate trustee um, on specific trust for our clients, for our and high net um, worth clients. We also review the trust deeds of our clients. And what we sometimes find in reviewing those trust deeds is that the trust deed is a bit outdated. It's not out in line with the existing or the current tax legislation and court cases that took place. So what we do um, as part of the service we provide our clients is to review the trust deed, identify the specific clauses in a trust deed which needs to be amended, bring the trust deed basically up to date. We also do termination of trust, so where the trust is being terminated, we basically provide that services as well. And one of the things that uh, that we also get quite a, a request of clients in the ultra high net, in high net worth um, space is where children is becoming and moving um, up to become the trustees of the trust is to provide trustee training to to the family and to see what is your your responsibility as a trustee and what what must you do as a trustee. And we basically do a specific training for the the, the the new trustees, trustees coming up, so they can understand what is of fiduciary responsibility and what you're supposed to do from your side. We also look at deceased estates. So from our side, we are, in most cases, we draft the world for our clients, local wills and offshore wills, and we basically appointed as the corporate um, executor to the deceased estates. And we basically provide a sliding, discount the sliding scale for our clients. So the more, the greater the amount um, of wealth you have at the date of death, um, the less in terms of executor's fees you basically pay. Um, so that is one of the services. And also we provide services in terms of the offshore assets for our clients. We need probate needed um, in order to administer those assets offshore when you do pass away, we basically provide that services as well for our clients. And what we also do for clients is to review their wills. Um, whenever a big event takes place in their lives or there's a bit of changes that are taking place in their lives and then basically we review the existing wills, we provide them advice in terms of how to, to set up the new wills or make changes to the wills and that will basically be on the local will and the offshore will and also to make sure when we give advice to the clients in terms of the wills, look at the local and the offshore wills to make sure that the wills speak to each other and it actually executes at date of death and it actually at date of death what you want to be executed is also practical and that, that's also very important. The other service that we also provide for clients is services in terms of local advice. So in our team of people, we do provide our clients because of the structures they've got. Um, we provide them advice in terms of how can they restructure their affairs um, in a much better way, in a much more efficient and effective way in terms of the objective. So we do provide 642 advice and assist with the implementation of that and as, as well intergroup transactions for our clients who's got perhaps trust structures with multiple under companies, underneath holding companies and subsidiary companies. And we also provide estate duty planning and which we find actually key in the advice that we give to our clients 
is to look at the estate duty plan of the specific client as holistically and locally and offshore assets, ensuring that the client, if you do that estate duty calculus, to ensure that when you do draft your will, that at your date of death, if this is state duty payable, taxes payable, is there enough, enough liquidity in your estate? Um, and if there is not enough liquidity in the estate, the estate duty planning and scenario planning we do for client is to see where can we in future or what can we do in order to make sure there is enough liquidity at date of death. And that also assists in when you draft the will and you do the whole structure for our clients to make sure that we, the client is not in a space where at date of death, where the, where the beneficiaries or, or those who are, are or benefiting from this that have to dispose of certain assets. So that is state duty planning is crucial for our clients. We do that holistic from local to also to make sure that from a holistic point of view, there's enough liquidity in this that everything is structured in a proper manner and is practical to execute. And then in terms of the, of the, Additional advice we give from the offshore side is we advise clients in terms of cessation of tax, re tax residency. So those clients whose children are living abroad and they have decided to cease the tax residency with South Africa or some of the clients have decided, no, we're leaving, we're going to stay in Australia, so we're immigrating. So we also do provide clients with advice and the implementation of that advice um, in terms of the cessation of tax residency and your, your regularize, regularizing your fees with the, with the South African Reserve Bank. Um, in terms of the offshore advice, what we also find is because clients are now more diverse in their investments, part of the advice we give for our clients is to see which part of those specific assets is actually subject to um, U.S. citizens, um, U.S. estate taxes, U.K. inheritance taxes. So where are those assets basically located offshore? And basically what we assist the client was to see what is the effect of having those specific offshore? Is there any other type of product or plan that we've got that can actually reduce any form of estate duty, um, estate duty or inheritance tax liability in the U.S. in the U.K. So what we do in terms of part of the whole estate duty planning for clients as well is to see that what products do we have as selling private wealth that can actually fit in well in order to reduce those specific offshore um, tax inheritance issues that the client might have. And we also provide the client with cross-border taxes because of of where clients are now in in diverse by portfolios assets across board we basically provide advice in terms of what are the tax consequences in the different jurisdictions and how to best to structure your fees in, in in that case so that's basically the the fiduciary tax team overall what we type of advice we basically provide and assist our clients with and i'll give over to my colleague um anton who will be um, touching on some also um, matters this, um uh, interesting times we're living in. Um, I've been basically just for purpose of the seminar, it's strange not to be able to see people's faces when you, when you do these type of things. Normally you can gauge whether people fall asleep or not. So, uh, you want to throw me with something? Luckily it won't hurt me on this side, but I hope you enjoy the session. At the moment, I think the question was what, are, what are the activities that we are dealing with at the moment where we get the most queries, uh, from South African clients specifically? Um, as far as their long-term plan from a South African fiscal perspective. And I think we've, I've identified three areas, as Stanley mentioned. It is basically um, your uh, immigration processes, and obviously that aligns with the income tax consequences of actually moving uh, from a South African base to an offshore base. And then we also have uh, certain clients that have been working abroad and uh, South Africa offered a very favorable taxation system up to 1 March 2020, where a large percentage or basically if you qualified, most of the income you earned offshore would be exempt. There's been some drastic changes to that. So that's probably at the moment where we get the most or give the most advice to clients on. And lastly, we'll just check on, um, at the moment, what type of structuring opportunities there are. Offshore trust is still very topical. Uh, given the current economic climate, they're probably not as uh, economical as they used to be, especially from a cost and a tax perspective. But we'll touch that on, on that at the end. I think just starting with immigration, there's in the South African context quite a misperception about immigration and the interaction with taxation. Immigration in the pure sense is, from a South African perspective, 
an exchange control process, and we refer to it as formalizing your immigration via the South African Reserve Bank. That, in effect, means that you are giving up your South African permanent residency. It is not that you are giving up your permanent residency. It is just from an exchange control perspective that you are viewed as not being a permanent resident of South Africa when a person formalizes his immigration for exchange control purposes. And another misperception is that if I immigrate, do I, can I keep my nationality? There's immigration, again, it is an administrative process, it is an exchange control process, it has absolutely nothing to do with a person's nationality. So a person can immigrate as long as he wants, he can still retain his South African passport, that is not uh, affected. There are certain other rules, for example, when you acquire another or want to acquire another nationality, then under the South African legislation, you have to be very careful because if you don't apply for permission to hold double uh, nationality, then in effect, you can lose your South African passport. So for any person who wants to use a South African national and who wants to, for example, immigrate and obtain another nationality, before you start that process, you have to approach home affairs and obtain permission to acquire a second nationality. If you do not do that, within the ambit of the legislation, you can lose your South African nationality. There's different rules according to the uh, whether the Citizenship Act and the um, Constitution actually are in line. So theoretically, because you always have permanent residency by birth, they can't take it away from you. But not to go through all the hassles, just be make sure that when you do apply for another nationality, that you make sure that you actually obtain the necessary permission to acquire a second nationality. So immigration, and another um, um, misperception is when I immigrate, I automatically stop to be a tax resident. There is nothing as far from the truth as that. So... Immigration, because it is a formal process, what you are basically saying to the South African Reserve Bank that I am leaving South Africa and I want to rid myself of the South African exchange control provisions. That's about all. In order to do that, you are in effect, but not really, giving away your South African uh, permanent residence status. So if you go to a bank, for example, in South Africa and you want to open a bank account, the banks will always ask you for your ID. Now, if a foreigner who is not a South African exchange control resident wants to open a South African bank account, they can't because they don't have an ID. So your ID is very important from a South African Reserve Bank perspective. And when a person formalizes their immigration, they are in effect then for Reserve Bank purposes and normal banking purposes in South Africa saying they don't have an ID anymore. You still have the ID. It's still yours. But you are, as an immigrant, are not allowed to operate on the same basis as having the South African ID. In other words, you are then the same as a formal, as a foreigner coming to South Africa on immigration. You no longer have the right to utilize your ID to actually open bank accounts. And from a, not going into details, but there's normally a five year period that if you immigrate and you come back within that five year period, there's a, that's a failed immigration. And if you've taken all assets off, offshore with them, with, and you return within that period, the Reserve Bank can force you to bring those assets back. Now, immigration at the moment is, for us as advisors, it's a little bit tricky because in the latest budget speech, uh, the announcement was made that immigration as a term or for utilization for exchange control purposes will be phased out within the next 12 months since the date of the budget. The argument within the, the from a from a treasury perspective is, and also probably Reserve Bank, is that the South African Reserve Bank has been utilised as almost a mechanism to protect the South African tax base because the flow of funds went through the Reserve Bank and they had to, you had to get a tax clearance certificate and all those type of things to get money out. And Reserve Bank and SARS probably decided that it would be better if they can actually have more risk. Uh, mechanisms within the income tax system rather than relying on the, the on the exchange control provisions to cater for 
uh, the flow of funds or the protection of the asset base, in other words, forcing people or, or, or uh, getting people to uh, pay their, their taxes on foreign earnings or income that they have. And there, I think what they will be doing in the very new, near future is to basically rely more on things like the common reporting standards. In other words, if you open a bank account in a foreign country, and that foreign country basically has to report to, uh, or the bank institution has to report back to SARS or to, with, to the fiscal authorities about you as a non-resident actually having a bank account or investment account etc. And the same thing applies in America, it's called FATCA. So they are basically the voluntary, the, the, the formal sharing of information via this fiscal authorities, including SARS. And if you have an asset bank account, these type of things, SARS will basically know about that. And that brings about, is there still a requirement for having this immigration process as such uh, to qualify whether you are now a person uh, entitled to open a bank account, not to stake out money, having block grant accounts, and all those type of things. So it will be interesting to see how this pans out. Unfortunately, COVID and Corona and all these type of things have probably put a little bit of a, uh, a break onto the whole process. Uh, and the 12 month period that they've indicated something will happen will probably be pushed out significantly long, longer. So for the moment, for a person who wants to, to leave South Africa and rid himself of the exchange control provisions, the only mechanism is to formalize your immigration through the exchange control process. Now, cessation of tax residency is, and, and this is also in the budget, when they made these announcements as far as uh, removing the concept of immigration, that the ordinary residence test remains the only test to determine a person's tax residency. Now, South Africa has a peculiar mechanism to determine tax residents. Um, typically, I see a lot of clients, especially in the Cape Winelands area, who have uh, properties offshore and, and obviously foreigners particularly coming to, to come to South Africa over the summer months, spend time here, and then go back to their home country. Now, South Africans typically think we can do the same. So if I'm a South African, I can just go and stay for six months in another country and then by virtue of not being 183 days in South Africa, I'm out of the tax net. Not so. It's quite a little bit more complex than that. South Africans' primary test for residency or tax residency is what we refer to as the ordinary residence test. Now, that is an intentional test. It is not reliant on days or amount of time you spent in South Africa. It is really if a person says, where is my heart? Which, which country am I the close, the closest affiliated with? It is what we call home. So typically South Africans, and I've been offshore for 10 years, you always talk about home. South Africa is home. That's where you want to, if you want to use the court cases analogies, analogies is the country where you want to return from your wandering. So South Africa, if you if you leave South Africa, even if it's for 30 years, and you want to return to South Africa after you've gone and experienced the world and all those type of things, then for that period of 30 years, you remain a South African tax resident. The only way to cease to be ordinary resident is to form an absolute intention that you want to go and live in another country with a degree of permanence. The very moment you make that decision, then basically you will in essence cease to be a tax resident for South African tax purposes under the ordinary residence test. In Afrikaans, when I do presentations, normally there's a, I just say for, for cessation of tax residence, you have to take your pie and buy. You have to go. You can't stay in South Africa a little bit and be in another country for a little bit and, you know, have all your family ties and your friends, you still have a car and a house and all these type of things in South Africa, then it's very unlikely that you will satisfy uh, the, 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 the criteria to meet the old new residence test. So there is a very strict uh, rule to comply with in order to cease to be a South African tax resident under the old new residence test. Now, where the confusion arises is South Africa also have a second test. And the second test is a day counting test. It's actually a 90-day 
91-day test over a five-year period, but on average, it also comes to about 183 days. But that test only applies if the ordinary residence test does not apply. So as long as your intention is to, re to return to South Africa or not to really leave South Africa, you will remain a South African income tax resident irrespective of the amount of taxation, uh, uh, amount of days that you spend outside South Africa. So because uh, the ordinary resident based on intention, we often use immigration as a form to show intention. So if I pack my uh, the container, I've put the dogs and cats in quarantine, I closed my bank accounts, sold the car, got a new driver's license, got a permit, everything in the new country, then those facts are normally sufficient to show that these, this is my intention and here's the documentary evidence to prove that this is my intention, that I want to leave South Africa with a degree of permanence. If you then on top of that also say, but look, I've also emigrated. That is another factor, but emigration is definitely not the sole factor. And the confusion really arose, again, from an immigration perspective, because SARS issued what we call a tax clear, an immigration tax clearance certificate. And a lot of uh, commentators have said, because I've got this immigration certificate, SARS has basically acknowledged that I've ceased to be a tax return. No, not at all. It is still your intention. So what you put in form and what your intention is may, may, may to be two totally different concepts. Now, ceasing to be a tax resident is the easy part as far as, uh, well, as, far as cost is concerned. Because South Africa typically says if you want to leave South Africa and you confirm with, or conform with all the requirements and you can show that obviously your intent is to leave with the your permanence, you're happy to go, but before you go, South Africa or SARS will basically, in effect, says, well, then you are dead to us. And we all know when you are die, when you die, you pay capital gains tax on a deemed disposal basis. Cessation of tax resident has exactly the same consequences. South Africa basically says because you earned or you had the capacity to generate all your assets via you whilst you were in South Africa, it will only be fair for SARS to say, but thank you very much, up to date, when you cease to be a tax resident, we want our slice of the pie. In other words, we will also treat you on the, theoretically there's a day before, you will basically then be treated as disposing of all your assets wherever situated. So your worldwide assets will be the subject to a CGT, what we refer to in common terms, exit charge. The only asset that is excluded from that charge is basically fixed property situated in South Africa. And the only reason why that is excluded is because foreigners, if a typical person from the UK buys the property in South Africa and they sell that, they will still pay capital gains tax in South Africa as a non-resident. So all you're doing is you will pay the extra charge on all your assets. If you have fixed property, there won't be any capital gains tax on that. But two years later, when you sell that as a non-resident, you will pay the capital gains tax there. The other mechanism to cease to be a tax resident is reliance on a double taxation treaty. Now, this can become quite complex. Now, typically, you have to be a resident in both countries, so you can be tax resident in multiple jurisdictions. Um, typically, where well, those jurisdictions will have a double taxation treaty. Now, in our domestic legislation, the Income Tax Act, it basically says you are a South African resident if you are ordinary resident or if you qualify in terms of the physical presence test, which is the day counting rule that I said. But again, remember the ordinary resident must rule will always apply first. The day counting rule will always apply, apply only if the ordinary resident doesn't apply. But then the definition goes further and it says, but you will not be considered to be a South African tax resident if you are deemed to be exclusively a resident of another country by virtue of a double taxation treaty. So reliance on a double taxation treaty often result in exactly the same consequences as a person physically ceasing to be a tax resident under the ordinary resident debt criteria. And this is typically where this comes uh, quite, or, or, or is, is quite an issue, is typically for people uh, South Africans who have been working in Dubai, for example, Singapore, most of the low tax jurisdictions, uh, 
before could work there on an employment basis and under Section 1010 in the income tax legislation to the extent that you were 183 days outside South Africa, of which 60 of those 183 days were consecutive, then that foreign income was exempt from taxation in South Africa. Now, that's also, a, I see a lot of clients and say, well, I've been working offshore, I've ceased to be a tax resident. Theoretically, there's, Section 1010 is totally separate from your ordinary resident or your tax residency status. Section 1010 is an exemption, and I always try to explain to most clients, you can only be, get an exemption from taxation if you are taxable in the first place. So you are still, as an ordinary resident, if you are still a South African resident working abroad, subject to all other taxes. So it's only your salary income that will typically be exempt. And I see a lot of clients that come and see you and say, oh, well, they've been tax living tax-free, now they want to come back to South Africa. Uh, how do they manage? And so, well, you actually have not been tax-free. Your only income tax exemption was your salary income. Any capital gains, any sale of uh, properties offshore, any interest, any rental on property, still had to be uh, 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 reflected and, and uh, filed in your South African return. You can imagine the surprise when that happens. Now, since 1 March 2020, that total exemption has basically uh, been uh, called in. So if you want to call it that, recall. So any person who works abroad on a salary and stays offshore and provide the services for 183 days of week 60 are consecutive, will only now have the first 1.25 million of that salary exempt. So you can imagine there's quite a lot of the people in the banking industry, uh, oil industry, even pilots under certain circumstances that earn far more than that. And obviously the 1.25 is then a, a, a drop in the bucket. So the, the only relief or, or mechanism to get these people out of the South African tax system, especially for low, low tax countries where they don't pay tax, because South Africa will tax them fully now, is to get them out of the South African tax system, either by way of the double taxation treaty or by, by, uh, ceasing to be ordinary resident. And unfortunately, and this is in the case in most, in most cases, that will, uh, result in a capital gains tax exit charge. So in other words, as soon as you want to rid yourself of the South African tax system so that Section 1010 does not apply anymore, then you are going to trigger that capital gains tax exit charge. Luckily, at the moment, if you're looking at probably COVID has had a, a big effect on asset values. Uh, so there's quite a lot of guys that are pushing for this to go through quicker rather than later because the values are lower and therefore your capital gains tax is basically low at the moment. So, for immigration purposes, just going back, another reason why we sometimes use immigration as a mechanism for, for, for um, other than cessation of your exchange control residency, is because you can access a retirement annuity once you have formalized your immigration. So in other words, if a person has a retirement annuity, you are basically, excuse my friend, stuffed. Uh, to get any benefits out of that retirement annuity before the age of 55, where after you can uh, retire from the fund, but you cannot get full access to the whole thing. On immigration, however, and that can, you know, you don't have to retire from the fund at 55, that can continue as a retirement annuity, and then on uh, immigration, full access to the retirement annuity can be had, again, subject to income tax. So, those are the, the main issues we are dealing with at the moment, and, and the focus is pretty much on, on, on those. Also quite topical, people, especially given the current climate, people say, I want to take assets offshore, I want to put it in a safe environment, I don't want to have a sovereign or political risk. Uh, what about a trust, an offshore trust in particularly? And yes, offshore trusts are quite valuable, uh, from a asset protection perspective, and that includes, in certain instances, political risk. So there's there's a quite demand for demand for these type of structures at at the very moment. 
However, in order to create an offshore trust is quite different to the South African tax consequences. Well, it is more aligned since the introduction of what we have in South Africa, Section 7C, that says basically when you have an interest-free loan to the South African trust, then that interest component that is forgiven is now a donation, and therefore you must pay donations tax on that. Since 1 March 2013, even worse provisions apply to offshore trust, because if you form an offshore trust, you basically have to provide assets to the trustees, either in the form of a donation, or what is typically the mechanism used is to loan the funds to the trust, now, since 1 March 2013, because of the transfer pricing provisions, you couldn't loan assets to a offshore trust on an interest-free basis because SARS then basically said, very similar to 7C, instead of uh, deeming that as a donation, SARS then would have applied a deemed interest rate on that loan, which is market-related. And a misconception as well, people say, well, offshore, the, the interest rate is so low, I don't mind having an interest component on that low. One has to determine what is market-related for Section 31 or transfer pricing provisions. And that is basically, if you think about it, if I, as a settlor or a beneficiary of a trust, which happens in terms of the 10 million typically that people take out to put into offshore trust, if I give that to the trustees, I am the lender and the trustees are the borrower. So your uh, interest rate is normally, the borrower is normally standing looking to the bank and say, if I had to borrow funds from you, what interest rate would you have charged me? And that is where the market-related interest rate is determined. It is really determined on if the trustees, in that case, would have borrowed that money from an independent institution like a bank, for example, what rate of interest would the banks have charged the trustee? So you can't utilize the deposit rate that you as the settler or the lender you get on the deposit that you have on an offshore, offshore asset. You have to use the rate that the trustees would have been able to borrow from their bankers. That is typically the arm's length rate. And in general terms, we probably just, you know, a lot of banks will say, well, we're not going to give that to you. We don't know, et cetera, et cetera. But as a, in the historical terms, safe harbor rules that no longer exist, but we still use that as a benchmark is probably LIBOR or your loan, loan interbanking overnight rates at one, uh, one or two percent. Typically, the higher level is two percent. So that would be your interest. Uh, market-related interest, and that can be quite expensive. So if you look at dollar terms, sterling terms, you're probably looking at the current rates, but probably uh, LIBOR has gone down, but probably your average rate would be 3 and a half, four percent So if you loan funds to a trust by way of an interest-bearing loan, that would then basically be the same as SARS charging you an interest-related uh, rate on that loan. So why would you want to go through all the processes? of actually having SARS deem the interest. So the process that we use to form a trust, in other words, if funds are lent to the trust uh, on interest-bearing basis, is to make that arm's length. So the problem is, given the cost of offshore trust, and obviously given the current environment, if you have assets in the trust, it is probably going to be difficult in an uh, advisory sense to outperform the interest on the loans. And to the extent that your interest component is probably higher than the performance of the assets in the loan, you probably don't have an estate planning mechanism. Now, to get around all these complexities, what we have over the last few years tried to do is to say, well, in the case of that offshore trust where you have a loan which carries interest, you're going to pay tax at 45% on the interest rate on that loan, the loan amount still remains an asset in your estate. And on top of that, if the trustees do not pay the loan back or the interest back, the interest basically accrues to capital, get capitalized. So your loan amount increases every year, which to the extent, again, that the assets within the trust do not grow faster than those components, you actually don't have any estate due to uh, benefit really. So to short circuit that, we said, well, under those circumstances where a loan would have been a uh, 
asset in your estate in any event, why don't you just retain the asset? And the, we've looked at these type of structures we have within, within the Sunlum stable is to say within our operation in Mauritius, they do provide the trust services. Why don't we form a trust during the person's lifetime, but that trust will basically have very little assets. It will basically have a small bank account or cash held in that trust. And then either you can make the investments in normal unit trust or you can use wrapper vehicles and these type of things. And then either utilize your will or utilize the policy structure by way of beneficiary nominations to nominate that trust on your death as the beneficiary. So what will happen is, yes, the assets will still constitute an asset in your state. Secondly, you will have full control of the assets. But on your death, after the payment of South African estate duty, those assets now go into a full discretionary offshore trust. And then the assets within that structure is totally outside the ambit of the South African income tax net, unless, again, there's a distribution made containing uh, untaxed income or gains. But pretty much... If the money is not utilized within that trust for the second generation, there's no South African income tax liability or estate duty liability. In that. So, if, and I hate to use a, the product forum, but basically if we, we call this the, this the dry trust solution and we basically use South African uh, wrapper or Glacier offers these type of things, it is basically an offshore policy. In that policy, you can invest on equities and all these type of, 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 of uh, investment vehicles. Because that policy is a South African registered, it's still an offshore policy, but it's a South African registered policy that we refer to it as the five fund approach applies. In other words, the income tax liability within that product is only 30% on income and 12% on capital gains. So if you have assets within this wrapper vehicle, your income, you have a bit of tax arbitrage during your lifetime. In terms of the policy provisions, you can add the trust that you've already formed. It's alive. It's there as a beneficiary. And on the death of the plan holder, this product just moves literally over into the name of the trust. There's no capital gains tax as long as the underlying assets are not disposed of. So it is a quite uh, easy situation to get assets into the trust. Yes, you will still have to pay estate duty, but if you had a loan, you would have done that in any event. So this is quite an easy mechanism, and it's quite costly because to, to, to structure the trust initially, it will basically be a formation charge, and then they generally ask a, a little bit of an upfront fee for a few years to take the assets to keep the trust alive. and the benefit of this is also because it is a contract. So if you have a policy, it is a contract of insurance. And in terms of a policy, your will cannot actually deal with that contract. The contract predetermines that on my death, something happens to this plan or to the assets. And in that way, we, we basically utilize the nominated beneficiary provisions. So on your death, even if you note in your will that you've got a wrapper vehicle and you say it goes to X and Y to the extent that nominated beneficiaries are appointed. And that basically just brings it to the, to the whole thing to say that because you can't, the will cannot deal with it, neither can the executor, and therefore there's also no executor's fees. So if you have a structure where you invest in a wrapper vehicle, for example, on the wrapper vehicle there is a nominated beneficiary, which is an offshore full discretionary trust, which we call the dry trust. And that trust is nominated as the beneficiary. On your death, it can happen that that plan or the wrapper will move into that offshore trust seamlessly. There's no uh, executive fees. There's no administ state administration, etc., etc. And it's quite a cost-efficient and admin-efficient way of getting assets in the foreign trust. So, this is almost, if I can summarize it, we have created an offshore testamentary trust. Although it's not a, a trust that you create by will and way of will, you actually created this trust whilst you are alive. And in terms of the policy provisions, you have nominated this trust to be the, the beneficiary 
on your demise. And yeah, there's uh, the guys can talk to you as far as the uh, portfolio managers. There's different mechanisms. You can have different plan holders. You can have proceeds. You can have beneficiaries with ownership. There's a lot of flexibility within these type of structuring provisions. Um, Nice thing about this is, again, because the policy, because it's a South African registered policy, because it's subject to South African tax, you basically don't have uh, any capital gains tax on the transfer of the policy because paragraph 55 basically um, uh, stipulates that a person shall disregard any capital gains tax in, in terms of life policy uh, provisions. So no capital gains tax. When the trustees then basically cash this in after they receive the, the product, then obviously, yes, there will be capital gains tax. But as I mentioned, then it can be effectively tax free after that. Thanks for listening. All the details are on the website. Uh, please feel free to contact Anton or Stanley for further information.